and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and I have happily been chatting with Susan and Deb in, in the um, in the chat about what insect we would like to sketch today. There was a good amount of interest in any of the new. Excuse me. Um, I just took a nap before the live stream, so if I'm a little bit tired in the beginning, that's why. But, we'll get through it. So, um, we mentioned in the chat that we would like to do a brand new order of insects. So, I was thinking we could do stoneflies. They are in the order Plecoptera. And I don't think that we have done a stonefly yet. So something cool about stoneflies is that most of them are bioindicators of healthy streams and rivers. Um, so when you find them as, um, as immatures, a lot of times when you find a stonefly, you have, um, especially if you're finding multiple species of stoneflies or stoneflies and um, mayflies, uh, you can, you can actually do these indices to determine stream health with them, which is pretty cool. Hi, Hashi! Alright, so I think... I might be able to get the stonefly into one image under a microscope if I turn it diagonally in the frame. Aha. Good. So I don't have to measure it um, on my desk cam because it's actually small enough to see the entire insect on the microscope. So I'm going to go ahead and give us a measurement from the front of the head all the way. Because I can't see the back of the abdomen, we're going to go to the back of the wings. Our stonefly is 1.45 centimeters long. Now, <clears throat> because stoneflies is an entire order of insects, um, there are many different families of stoneflies and like perlids and perlodids and chrysoperlids and all types of stuff. Um, but I don't remember the identifying characteristics for the adults. Um, <clears throat> so we're just going to stick with Plecoptera. Oh, we did a stonefly! Recently, I thought that we did a caddisfly. Haha, <laughs> she says we've already done a stonefly. Okay, so let's um let's switch it up. <laughs> the one we did was twice as long. Okay. Yep, the we did we did the other specimen. Got it. All right. Thank you for letting us know that. I'm going to we're going to go ahead and pick a new insect. Um is there an insect that you would like to sketch?
we've done those. Ooh, a monarch! I, I think we've done a monarch together, right? Yeah, that one's a that one's a pretty one. Um, but they are considered an orthopteroid um, because they are they're considered an orthopteroid and I don't think that that's a monophyletic group or that that's like an actual classification if it was it would be maybe a super order but it's just a large group of orders that are all related to crickets and grasshoppers so in orthopteroids, you have crickets and grasshoppers and katydids, but you also have uh, cockroaches and earwigs and praying mantids and walking sticks. And if you give me two seconds, I do believe I'll be able to identify, actually, I think I previously have, for faculty, I previously have identified this earwig down to family. So we're going to go ahead and make sure that we can measure it from the front to the back. Sorry about the slow start getting an insect picked, but I'm glad we've got it all figured out now. Um, starting from the front of the head, and then I'm going to go to the back of the abdomen, not the back of the Cersei right here. And now, it's funny because a lot of times people ask, you know, why do insects have Cersei, or what's the point of them? And in earwigs, the point of their Cersei is defensive. They can actually pinch pretty good with those. <clears throat> um, the length from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, not including the Cersei, is 0.89 centimeters. <clears throat> You probably could round it up to 0.9 um, if the head was pulled up. And I do want to go ahead and measure the length of the Cersei because that's pretty impressive. Alright, so the Cersei are about half of the length of the body. So they are 0.4 centimeters. Almost half the body. Awesome. The, uh, the family name for this earwig that we have here is Forficuity. And 
And I did want to go ahead and look up really quick what the um, characteristics are going to be of, of that family. So that I know when we're looking at it. I don't remember. I believe it has something to do with the number of tarsal segments or maybe pads on the bottom of the tarsal feet. Um, but, if you give me two seconds, I can make sure I look it up and have the answer for us. The Cersei are for getting all your earwax out. That's really funny, but not exactly true because, um... Earwigs don't go in your ears. People used to think that they would go in your ears. But they don't. Maybe I'm not going to get them. I thought that they would have been right. So I like to use my, um, my notes back from college because I gave myself all of these really cool cheat sheets, although, and I know they're here somewhere, it's not in the flies, not in diptera, not in hymenoptera, not in beetles, maybe right here. Nope. Well, I'll have to look it up on my computer, but I don't believe, sorry guys, but I have access to that right now. Darn it. That's okay. Alright, so I don't know the characteristics for the family for faculty. And maybe I'll look it up, um, maybe I'll look it up in a, in a little bit after we start sketching. But I don't want to waste any more time. So, yep, we're just gonna call this friend an earwig. microscope I don't feel the need to um, to move it too much right now because all we need is enough of because all we need is um, a light outline so that we know about the ratios that we're gonna be sketching now the head on our earwig has is is very triangular kind of like a rounded triangle so when you're sketching that you can make sure the front of the head is narrower than the back and you want to kind of just make this a very light triangle. We're going to be coming back and fixing any of the lines and darkening them so just make sure that your sketch stays nice and light when we start and then we can go back and kind of harden it, um, darken it up. Alright, so we've got the head here. The next segment that we're going to see back is the pronotum. That's the first segment of our thorax. Um, on our earwig, it has almost parallel sides, but then it's going to come down into this U shape. Now, next is going to be our wings. Earwigs do have wings, and... I believe they do have the ability to fly, although I've never seen an earwig fly. So, um, but I but I do believe that they can. They're one of those insects that have wings and can fly, but regularly just don't. Um, their um, their wings are not elytra because they're not beetles. They're actually considered tegmina. 
I'll go ahead and uh, spell that out for you. FW stands for front wing or fore wing, and we call them tegmina. That means that they are leathery, kind of like a grasshopper front wing or a praying mantis front wing. Um, they're very similar, and that wing, along with the fact that they have a simple metamorphosis, um, is what makes them an orthopteroid. Alright, so we've got those nice long elytra, um, but they're only about a little bit over half of the abdomen, so we're going to continue that out. And I think it's kind of funny that the abdomen ends so abruptly. It doesn't narrow down at all. It's, it's kind of flat on the back. But then you have the Circe or those giant pinchers in the back. Now, I do believe that you can tell the difference males versus females um, with uh, depending on their Circe. There we go. So this one is a male. So male earwigs are going to have these very rounded um, cerci. And then female earwigs, their cerci are kind of straight and pointed. And they fit together. So the next time you're rolling over logs or flipping and looking under rocks and things like that, um, go ahead and look at the back of the earwigs. And that will help you determine male versus female. Um... I'm going to go ahead and just sketch, give us a really light sketch of what this is going to look like. So I'm just going to give a central line. Make sure that that is on the midline so that everything is parallel off of it. And I'm just going to give a straight line here. I know that there's a lot of dentations or teeth in there, but um, I'm not going to worry about them just yet until we zoom in. Then on the outsides, these edges come down and then arch out. And your goal is to make our Circe about um, as long as the abdomen and then half of the elytra. So, it looks like mine just have to be a little bit shorter. But that'll be fine. Let's see. Something like this. And I'll be able to come back and fix some of these angles. <laughs> ba -da -ba -ba -ba. All right. So um, we're going to have six legs, obviously. Our front pair is going to be going up. Our middle pair comes backwards. And our hind pair comes backwards. So unlike robber flies and other insects that have those forward-facing legs, this guy is the average insect. His middle legs go backwards. And if we were going to give him a name for those antenna, we would call them filiform. Long and straight. Let's zoom in. I love when you focus on the top of the pin, that you, how you can see um, the gold. It's pretty. All right. Be nice, kitties. Sometimes they just need a little reminder. turn our earwig or angle our earwig just a little bit so that we can see the head flat because because this specimen did, um, did kind of angle its head down and I want to get the flat
full view. There we go. Think that's going to be good. Do all orthopteroids have filiform antenna? Yes. I can't think of a single orthopteroid that doesn't have... Actually, there is one that I can think of. Termites are an orthopteroid. Um, termites are actually considered a type of communal cockroach. They're in the same order as cockroaches nowadays. And cockroaches are an orthopteroid, which means termites are too now. And termites have um, what we call beaded antenna. They actually have, I think they call it monoliform. Monoliform. Um, and it means beaded. Yeah, she does have a pretty kind of, oh, oh my goodness, that's not a necklace. That's not a necklace, and it's not hair. Those have legs. Those are, um, mites. Those are commensalistic mites. Um, so the mites are getting a benefit from hitching a ride on the earwig, but um, the earwig is not injured by the fact that she's carrying all of these mites. And so we call that commensalism. They are not eating my collection. They passed away and they died on the specimen. Um, so those are animals that were taking a ride back in the day and I had just never noticed them. Yep, exactly, Susan. They were there when I collected the earwig. So they've been on that earwig since I collected it in 2010. Like the mites that clean out our eyelashes when we sleep? Well, those are, they're, they're, those are different, right? Um, the mites that clean out our, our um, eyelashes while we sleep, our eyelash mites, actually don't have, you're going to laugh, it all comes back to butts. The eyelash mites don't have buttholes. <laughs> they, um, they eat and they eat and they eat and they become constipated and then they die and fall off your face. Um, whereas these mites, um, do have the ability to produce waste. Yes. But they are commensalistic. Yeah. So, um, they, they are gaining a benefit from living off of us. Um, and if there's actually a benefit to them eating our eyebrow, our eyelash gunk, then you could, you might be able to call it mutualistic. Um, commensalism is when they're not causing any, any problems, but they're also not doing any good. They're just hanging out there. Um, and our eyelash mites, you almost could argue that that's a mutualistic relationship because... They, um, they help us by cleaning our eyelashes, and we help them by giving them food. Reminds me of the figures at Pompeii, frozen forever in the acts of their everyday lives. Aww. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's a, it's a good, um, that's a good, it reminds me of. For sure. No, come on. 
Welcome back. I swear you can bump it just a little bit and the specimen goes all the way off the screen. Here we go. Alright, so that's about where I have the ability to go ahead and sketch. So, um... Yes, pretty much all orthopteroids have filiform or straight antenna. Um, and they also, I think all of them have chewing mouth parts. So they have, um, or you could call them mandibulate. Um, just meaning that they have mandibles. They have the ability to chew and swallow their food. Uh, so now that we are looking close up at the head of our earwig here, um, the triangle might not be as, um, as intense as the first time I sketched it. So I'm going to go ahead and erase some of these lines and we're going to get this, um, this head into the approximate correct shape. But we know how large it's supposed to be, which is a huge help. So on the back of our head, um, we're going to be, instead of making it so triangular, we're going to try and make it more like a U where the sides um, come up parallel just a moment. And I'm going to go ahead and darken that because I think that that's going to be about right for my earwig. And then right after we have this nice U on the back of the head, we're going to be adding in our compound eyes. Getting my picture closer to the camera. There we go. Uh, we're going to be adding in our compound eyes. Now you can see that they're kind of like little L's into the body. So I would just go ahead and sketch an L here and then make it bulb out, but just past the edge of the head. Um, they don't have huge bulbous eyes. You just want to make sure that those eyes are separate from the head and the body. Um, so we're going to give another L on this side, and we're going to do the same thing, trying to keep our eyes at about, about the same size. All right. Um, moving forward from our compound eyes on the left and the right, we are going to be adding, let's see, line that looks like these. My students like to call these backwards parentheses. You know, if you put the parentheses in the wrong spots and instead of doing this, you end up doing this. That's what we call backwards parentheses. So you can add some of these backwards parentheses in here. <laughs> um, coming in towards the top. And then we're going to make it, instead of making it rounded up here, we're just going to straighten it off. I think it needs to get a little bit narrower. Just a little bit. Just a skosh. All right. So we've got those, um, those kind of concave lines here are so that we can connect the antenna here. You can see the scape pretty prominently in our, um, in our picture. That first segment of the thorax, of the sorry, of the thorax. That first segment of the abdomen is our scape. And you can see that it is pretty long. It's wide. It's like, I'm here. So I'm just going to go ahead and add our scape in now. Um, we do have a handful of awesome mouth parts happening up there in front. Um, I wonder if I could zoom in any closer to those mouth parts. That's better. So when I'm looking at an in 
insects mouth parts there's a couple of things that I'm looking for I'm first looking for the labrum l-a-b-r-u-m that's the upper lip if you look right about here on our specimen it almost looks like this kind of flattened d right here that is the labrum or the upper lip so you can go ahead and from the top here give yourself a little hill that's our labrum but you want to leave a little bit of space on the left and the right for the actual mandibles because if you look down a little bit you can see this second layer here and those are the mandibles this one's on the left and it meets over here in the center and there's another one on the right that meets in the center and I was admittedly I was trying to see if they met at a point but I think that they might meet more blunted <laughs> all right so coming from the front of our labrum we're just gonna make two nice little arches um that go from the front to the edges that we left alone and that is going to be our um and that's gonna be how we sketch our chewing mouth part from the top here so i'm just coming in and darkening some of these lines making sure they're all ready to go um, I do want to add the, um, I'm going to go ahead and add the antenna at the end. Sometimes I do it in the beginning, sometimes I do it in the end. I'm feeling like pushing them off a little bit today. So we'll come back to the antenna. What do earwigs eat? Earwigs are kind of omnivore-ish. They are omnivore-esque, I guess I'm going to call them. Um, they eat what they can find, but a lot of times we call them, we call them detritivores. Um, so detritus is like dead and dying plant material, um, but detritivores get to um, be a part of a lot of the decomposition and breakdown process in the woodlands. So you find these guys in um, the same types of places that you might find kind of roly polies or wood louse, depending on what you call them. I do know if you're trying to rear these guys in captivity, they also eat cat food. That's kind of fun. They do, so that's the thing, is they like detritivore. Um, they like detritus, or dead and dying plant materials, like broken down leaves and broken down stuff, but they also do need a solid amount of protein in their diet, so I'm guessing that they mostly are going to eat dead and dying things, but not like roadkill, more like helping break down stuff. You find them in your compost bin, that makes sense. They're being helpful in your compost bin. I think that there's also another name for animals that take a ride on another animal. I don't remember what it is. I'll look it up if I have time. I didn't bring my water. You find them. Foracy! Yes, that's the word I was looking for, Susan. Thank you. Um, so they, these mites would be considered also phoretic mites because they, um, <clears throat> 
they are not, um, they're not cleaning the exoskeleton or anything. They don't really benefit. They're just hitching a ride. And where they have found a place that's safe that the earwig can't knock them off is between the head and the pronotum. Now, a lot of times you'll see commensalistic or phoretic mites on burying beetles. Um, or sometimes you find, <clears throat> like, pseudoscorpions connected to beetles and connected to um, some wasps. And so I always love finding those phoretic guys that are hanging out on the specimens because I, I've i just always thought it was kind of cool. And it's always fun to see an an another living animal that's even smaller than the animal that you were collecting. Like, oh yeah. They get smaller. <laughs> um... <coughs> <coughs> So our pronotum here has par is parallel edged, and then when it comes down to the bottom, the bo bottom is pretty rounded. I was fixing that just a little bit, making mine a little bit more roundy. Cool. All right, so we have our head, we have our pronotum taken care of. If you want, you can add those little mites here. Uh, they're kind of like a little necklace. Oh, they thought they had found a safe place. Aww. They were safe until the end. You always like a nice flange on the edge of the pronotum. That's also a cool statement right there. It's nice and kind of expanded over the center line. So there's a, an area where it's nice and light. And I was wondering if that was a flange. Yeah, it is. Look at that. Cool. And the tegmina are also the same way. You can see that there is... Um, you can see the edge of the body through it. So, come on, Terry. Terry doesn't want to be selected. There we go. All right. Um, if you see right here, you're actually looking at the um, body, and this is the tegmina that comes out a little bit further over the edge. All right. Um, so, originally, I had started my tegmina down here at the end of my pronotum, but it looks like what we're actually going to be doing is starting the um, tegmina from right about where our pronotum stops being parallel. So this little U in here is actually going to be above our tegmina, and then this is where our tegmina come out. And I'm trying to see if that's square. All right, so that's kind of angulate. I want to point this out. So if we're looking here and it goes around the edge, and then you see that it comes in a little bit and then continues moving forward. That little edge and this section here is normally um, held around the body, kind of tucked over the side. So you can see on the left, you can't really see this part here because it is kind of folded down around the body. Whereas on this side, it's kind of sticking up. So you can sketch the earwig in either direction, but um, um, the left side is more realistic to its natural pose. This side on the right just looks like it unwrapped itself a little bit. But it's a good and cool detail to add to if you'd like. <clears throat> All right. So our tegmina start from way up here. And 
and they do meet in the center. Unfortunately, my pin went between the tegmina, so that's generally no good. They are going to meet centrally, and they do, their tegmina do end kind of like elytra do, where they do have this kind of sharp pointed edge. here and I'm gonna make the right side match the left side because I think for me and my sketch it's just gonna look a little bit more more better haha <laughs> So, um, earwigs have really, really beautiful hind wings that they do have the ability to fly with. And they have this really interesting way that they also, um, kind of fold up on top of themselves. So if we are looking uh, at our hind wings and they were all the way opened up, um, what you can see <coughs> is they would come up like this. And then they kind of have this shape where it comes up straight and then they have a series of veins that all go this way. And so when they're, um, when they tuck it all in, they can fold this wing kind of in and then fold it in again and that's how they get their wings so short is they use these wing veins that they have that are almost like it reminds me of a bat wing sometimes with all of these fingers and they fold in and then they fold in again <laughs> she says like a bat yeah exactly like a bat <laughs> Their wings are pretty beautiful, but I've never tried to open them because they are very, very fragile. They're very, very delicate. All right, now we have... Uh, now all we have to do is go ahead and count some abdominal segments to see how many are after our elytra. Now, let's see. This one is underneath the elytra. This one is going to be the first one visible, and it's only halfway visible after the elytra, but that's okay. So this one's going to count. We're going to count this one as one, two... Three, four, it looks like about approximately five segments after the elytra um, for our sketch, for our sketching purposes. There are more than five abdominal segments on our friend here, but the rest of them are underneath the, I keep saying elytra, I mean tegmina. The other ones are underneath the tegmina. All right, so I gave myself a little start to that, um, to this segment, and I'm going to come down here. I think that I'm going to want my abdomen to be a little bit longer than I had originally sketched it. I think my abdomen is just a little short, so I want to zoom out really quick and give myself a new... new line really quick. Okay. So I just went ahead and gave myself and lengthened my abdomen just a little bit. It cut into my Cersei, but I'm going to be able to resketch re those anyway. So right about here, our abdomen... 
I want it to start, I want mine to start a little bit wider than what I originally started it. So I'm going to start it out here. And we're going to have this first segment like this. And I'll work off of that. That'll be good. So we've got first segment. The second segment is going to be about that same length from the end of the tegmina to the segment. So we're going to give it this one here. And then um, the next segment is kind of short. It's kind of uh, significantly um, thinner than all the previous ones. And it kind of curls, so it's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit wider at the edges. Kind of curls in like this. Then we've got one more. That also kind of curls in and up. And then this last one is the one that proceeds down. I just have to fix a couple of these lines and I think uh, this will be all right. structuring um I don't know if I would particularly call it punctations like individual pinpoints um if we look down I can see some I guess your answer is maybe a little bit, but probably not enough to um, to make it kind of a defining character or a character that is significant. Let's see. With better, we uh, we move the specimen for different lighting. I'm curious if those are going to come out a little bit better. You could argue that those are punct that that's punctate. But I think that I would more call it um textured. Maybe even leathery or rough textured. So this is what a male earwig Circe look like. If I was going to draw the female just really quick off to the side to give you an example, rather than them being them wide and open like that, females... Female Circe look more like this. They're long and straight. Rather, and, and a lot of times they might even um, they might even be even closer than that. 
So they come off of the body and they pretty much go straight backwards. That's the ladies. But the males are um, have these nice curves on them. Now both the males and the females can open up their Cersei and pinch and use them for their defensive mechanisms and those types of things. Don't let an earwig crawl up your pants. Do they use the teeth for extra gripping during the mating process? I believe the answer is yes. I have not done a whole lot of research on earwigs, um, but yes, the, um, the males have these wider cerci for um, reproductive purposes, and um, because the males are going to be holding on to the females, it makes sense that they have a little bit of extra grippy at the end to kind of hold the ladies still. So I um, moved my, I lengthened my abdomen a little bit, so I also am just going to give myself a new outline for my, I need a new outline for my, um, for my Cersei. Alright, so I'm going to start on the left side because I like the left side looking, the look of the left side better than the right side. So hopefully after I get it all figured out on this side, the right side will come easy to me. Um, on this left side, we're going to arch all the way down. Make sure that that point um, where the... Cersei Connect is midline on your specimen here. It's got dentations or little teeth right here at the base of the Cersei. And then it has one extra tooth right here. Um, and that's going to be the tooth on both of the Cersei. And then all now we've got to do is finish the arch. <clears throat> and then erase any of these helper lines. And then do the same thing on the other side. We're going to give it those dentations or those teeth. Let's see. I'm going to start... That's pretty good. Alright. Um... And then after our teeth here, we come in a little bit. We give her this, give him this other tooth, and then finish off our Cersei strong. That's really cool. I'm pretty happy with the earwig so far. It looks like a nutcracker. That's funny because it's the boy. <sighs> I'm going to be turning our specimen upside down so that we can see some of these legs. I did just take off the labels of our specimen, so I need to remember to put them back on. <clears throat>
looked over our specimen and I was looking at it. I don't know what it's holding on to. This is weird. I don't know what that is. This should have been the end of the tarsal segment here. Looking at earwigs from the bottom reminds me of cockroaches. <clears throat> All right, I'm just trying to get us a decent look at a leg here. And the legs are being a little bit difficult, but this right here is your femur, this here is the tibia, and the tarsal segments are going to be right here in this region. Right there. You can see the last kind of tarsal claw right up here. I was hoping to find a better look at this leg. Good texture on that tibia. Cool. All right, um, while we, uh, I'm going to give you guys a moment to check that out. I'm going to take one more look for earwigs in my book because I know that they're here. Um, because I would really like to know, I do believe that the characteristic for families of earwigs is in the tarsal claws and I think it's whether rather the if the tarsal segments are two two or three segmented Lygiate psyllids stuff. So, um, dermapterans, they are our earwigs here. Um, and the two big families that we, we find in Michigan are, are Forficulity and Labiety. Um, so I had to know both of those two families. And the difference is in the second tarsal segment. So, um, You'll, you may have noticed that there was something kind of weird happening on our earwigs tarsal segments. The second tarsal segment is lobed and prolonged underneath the third tarsal segment. Whereas the second one in Labiids is just kind of a basic cylindrical segment that ends. Um, so if we go back and we look at the, this forficulid... That's probably why we were having an issue seeing and kind of, I was having an issue kind of understanding what was happening. look for 
for that. So this is actually on our hind leg, but um, I wanted to be able to show you the characteristics. So this right here is tars the first tarsal segment, tarsal segment one. And then if we look at tarsal segment two, um, it has a little bit of a wing underneath the third segment. So you see how it, it could just end here, but instead it comes out a little bit and then the third segment comes out. That's the characteristic that they're talking about. All four faculids or earwigs in this family have that second tarsal segment that expands uh, kind of underneath the third tarsal segment. We've seen that in other in other specimens, I'm sure. And admittedly, I'm pretty happy with the hind leg. <laughs> oh. It's all leveling in one spot, so it might be a good one to just focus on. I don't understand what's happening at the end of the second leg. Okay. Oh, I bumped it. There we go. Alrighty, let's do some legs. <clears throat> so as you saw, the legs are not very long. So we're not going to be making these guys too horribly long. And a lot of times you don't see a lot of legs when you're looking at the top of an earwig. But I always like to sketch them just so that we know kind of what they're looking at. Um, we've got our femur. We've got our tibia coming up. And we've got three tarsal segments. Now, what's really important with our with our tarsal segments is that the second one expands past where the third one is. All right, and I think, yeah, that'll work. So on the front legs, you can put the, the pad um, towards the body because they're on the underneath and a lot of times insects are standing like this. So you would see the pad towards the head. But on the hind legs, you're going to see the pad towards the body. So I'll go ahead and show you that too. My, <clears throat> my second pair of legs is not going to be coming out of the pronotum. It's going to be coming out what looks like right underneath the beginning of the tegmina. The femur comes up. The tibia comes back. And then we have three tarsal segments, right? Um, one, two, three. And the claw. All right, so we've got front leg, we have middle leg. Now our hind leg is a little bit longer than all of the other legs. So you can kind of make it pretty long. You can see that actually on this, from this angle, we can see this little piece here is the coxy. This little, what looks like a ball in between the coxy and the femur, that's the trochanter, spelled T-R-O-C-H-A-N-T-E-R. Um, and then you've got your tibia and these tarsal segments. So let's go ahead and get those sketched. Let's see. Fever. And the tibia. And then the tarsal segments. And I'm actually going to make this wing a little bit darker because I kind of like it. Yay! Now all we have to do is go back and add the, um, is go back and 
and add the antenna. How is your coloring book coming along? The coloring book is actually coming along pretty well. I have um, gotten a good number of the images sketched into, or um, scanned into my computer. I'm cleaning up some of the edges and I'm hoping I'm hoping to have it all ready to go in the next couple of weeks so that it can be Christmas presents. Because I also want to give them to my family for Christmas. Can we get a closer look at the mites too? Yes, we can get a closer look at the mites. I do want to get the antenna sketched first and then we'll go ahead and go back and zoom in on those mites. Although, those mites be, may be kind of at the edge of my microscope's ability. Um, I, don't have, um, I don't have another lens to get any closer than where I'm at. Alrighty. So, uh, we can actually count the number of segments. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm going to go ahead and count that with my mouse really quick. Yep, looks like we have 11 segments. Obviously, the first one is the scape. That little itty bitty one after the scape is the pedestal. And then the rest of them are the flagellum. And if you are counting just the segments on the flagellum, there are nine of them. Um, with, uh, with antenna that are like this, long and filiform, and they all have different segments, a lot of times I'll give myself a very light central line with about where I think about the length of my antenna are. I'm going to say they're probably about that long. So now I'm going to go back in and add segments around that line and that helps me keep it centered. I can do it on the other side too and then I'll know that the, the antenna are going to be about the same length. So let's see. It looks like up to... It looks almost as if the segments grow larger. A lot of times um, antennal segments are larger at the base and then they grow smaller towards the tip. But if you look this way, um, segments three, four, five, six, and then up to looks like seven, all of those segments are larger than the last. So let's see. Three, four, Five, six, seven. All right, looking good. And it looks like three that are about, if you include seven, so seven, eight, and nine are all about the same length. Um, one, two, three. And then 10 and 11 get a little bit smaller. They got to get smaller at some point. It looks like I could have lengthened those segments out a little bit. Maybe I'll come back in and fix that up. segments. I'd have to agree. How about a bug holiday card with a pun? Oh, that would be fun. I'd have to come up with one. I'm going to go ahead and cross hatch in those compound eyes because I hadn't done that yet. Um, and we're going to go and get a closer look at those mites. We're going to get as close as we can at least. All right. 
right, so on my microscope program, I also can zoom in like this. This might help us get just a little bit closer. Uh, so the reason that I can tell that these are mites is because you can see all of those legs. Aww. That would be really cute. Yeah, so I guess we could even count the number of mites. One, two, one, two, three, four. Five, six. And that is number seven. So it looks like there are seven phoretic mites on our earwig here. And they look kind of grody. <laughs> they just kind of look like white blobs with legs. Do any insects freak me out or do I love them all? I guess if any insect was going to freak me out, it would be ticks. I don't really like them. Um, I'm not afraid of getting them because I get ticks every year. Actually, last summer I accidentally walked through a tick nest and I took 75 baby ticks off of my leg. Um, so that was a wild experience. Um, yeah. So I guess if there was one insect that I don't really love as much as all the other ones, it would be um, ticks. Although, they're not technically considered an insect. I did know that. <laughs> um, I can't think of an insect, like a true insect that creeps me out. There are a variety of arachnids that get on the edge of that, like ticks. Um, these mites are a little bit creepy, but they're also kind of awesome because they've got those kind of wiry looking legs. Um, yeah, I can't think of an insect. I think that the weirder they get, kind of the cooler that they get. Um, whereas with some things like ticks, if they're trying to embed themselves on me, I'm not all about that life. <laughs> You want to consider it a median amputation? It was rough. I was using a um, I was using a, a lint roller to get them all off of me. Oh no, she had a tick in her eye. I I have seen pictures of that, and I never want to see pictures of that again. Okay, human bot flies. Fair. I don't know. I don't know if I'm really creeped out by human bot flies. I did know somebody who raised a bot fly in their arm. Um, they had gone on a on a collecting trip to Central or South America and got a bot fly and instead of killing it, they let it grow and um, emerged and they had named it and everything and it was at a MSU and they like it emerged from their arm. That was wild. Yeah, exactly, Susan. They decided to rear him into adulthood. I know somebody who reared a bot fly out of their arm. Um, it was, like, right about here, so it was easy to watch and manipulate and make sure that nothing weird was happening. Um, they, 
you know, they're parasitic, so they're not beneficial. They don't have any beneficial effects, but they're also not going to kill you, and they're not going to spread any diseases. So arguably, it's an okay thing to do, although you're not supposed to spread non-native insects, right? So um, ideally, you should not be bringing home bot flies from South America. sketch today and I'm glad that I was able to find those notes on the second tarsal segment and the way that it expands underneath the third one <laughs> make sure that nothing weird was happening sir you have a maggot in your arm <laughs> yeah you know you want to make sure it's not like <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not like you know becoming infected or getting any you know secondary stuff in it um because admittedly bot flies do have an open wound they need to breathe air so they leave their like little i believe they leave like a spiracle or something out of their arm out of your arm so that they can continue to breathe um, so just making sure that it didn't get infected or anything like that. Um, admittedly, I've not been super interested in human diseases, so I actually skipped medical entomology in university, um, just because I didn't really want to learn about, like, elephantiasis and all of the other many insect, um, spread diseases. I think that those kind of give me the creeps a little bit. Bot, fly bot snorkels. Yes, thanks so much. Fun and interesting. Oh, that makes me happy. Good. All right. So I'm glad that we all um I'm glad that we all had uh had fun today sketching the earwig here. Um we are let me look at so next week next week Thursday is Thanksgiving. All right. Theoretically, I should be home by 10 p.m., so I could do a live stream on Thanksgiving, but I do know... But I do know that um, some of you might be spending time with your family and friends on Thanksgiving. So um, I was going to go over to my closer, but then I wanted to ask you, ladies and gentlemen... Um, uh, what we were thinking about next Thursday. It looks like I deserve a holiday. Oh, great. Okay, so there will be no live stream next Thursday. I've already canceled my other out-school classes that I teach on Thursdays, so that means I will be free for the entire day, and I'll be able to sleep after all of those yummy turkey chemicals. All right, so... Um... <clears throat> Thank you for hanging out with me today, for chatting about insects, for um, waking me up from my nap. I really appreciate it. Um, the, I teach on out school. If you know anybody student age five to eight, nine to twelve that might want to be that might want to come and take a class from me, you can use the link in the description box below, and that is going to give them twenty dollars free from out school to take classes. And that's really exciting because in some of my classes are only $10. So you could take two classes for free if you wanted. Um, so go ahead and use that link below. Um, the, that up here is just to remind you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And this one down here is a link to my PayPal. That is um, just in case you wanted to throw me a little tip for, um, for what we learned today. If you had fun, all those types of things. I always super, super, super duper appreciate it. So many of you out there already do. And, um, and it just warms my heart. So I really do appreciate it. Um, and it's the reason why I keep coming back and that we've been doing this for a year now, you know? Um, it makes, uh, being with you guys and chatting, um, awesome. So, um, this is my email address.
address, Trisha at theinsectopia.com. If you wanted to send me an image of your beautiful sketch, you can go ahead and share it with me on that email. If you are a blogger, if you are posting it on Instagram, any of those things, go ahead and tag me at insectopia2015. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I will not be seeing you next week. <clears throat> So, the next time I will see you is on December 1st. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week. It looks like... Very good. It looks like we are all set. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful rest of your week. And stay buggy. Bye. <laughs>